Uh, when the Apostle John uh, wrote his epistle of First John in the latter part uh, of the first uh, century, he was likely the last living apostle among the twelve uh, called by Christ. Uh, and here is John, uh, likely in his 80s, maybe even his 90s, coming somewhat toward the end of his life, and he's passing on the baton of the gospel um, and of the Christian faith to that uh, next generation of believers. And as he's doing that, he is wanting to give to them something they truly need. Uh, it's what the church to whom, or churches to whom he's, he's writing, needs. It's what every Christian needs, and that is assurance. Uh, assurance of faith. Assurance of salvation. Assurance, confidence that indeed I am uh, among the children of God. I'm a child of God. This theme is woven through the whole letter. Uh, we've seen that it's really the heart of his purpose in writing. In chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I write these things to you so, who, who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. The language of knowing and having confidence is riddled through the letter. Chapter 3, verse 2. We know when he, Christ, appears, we will be like him. A couple verses later, chapter 3, verse 5. You know he appeared. He came to take away sins. Chapter uh, 3, verse 16. By this we know love. He laid down his life for us. But how do we know? How do we have assurance that we are a child of God? Well, throughout the letter, John gives us these tests. Kind of ways of examining our own faith. The sincerity, the legitimacy of our own Christian faith. He has given a moral test in chapter 1. Where he said, if we say we have fellowship with him, with God, but walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. When our lives are not reflecting what we profess. And we've seen a theological test. Chapter 2, verse 22. He says, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. John having to push back against the, the heresy and falsehood of Gnosticism, among other things. What we believe about Jesus Christ matters. Well, here in chapter 3, he returns to a theme he's already surfaced before, and that is the social test. How do I view and relate to the household of faith? What is my view of the church? How do I interact and relate to brothers and sisters in Christ? And so to that uh, end, we, we consider chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, as we continue here in 1 John. 1 John 3, 11 through 18. So let's give our attention to God's Word. John writes, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. For nearly a decade, our family lived uh, just outside the city of, of Philadelphia. If you've been there, it's a wonderful city, certainly a wonderful city to visit with its uh, very rich, rich 
uh, history to see the Liberty Bell or to tour Independence Hall where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were debated and adopted, uh, Franklin Square. Uh, there's much, much to see and enjoy. Uh, not too many years ago, a more recent addition to the city uh, was added, um, and it's considered an iconic statue uh, by some. It's on JFK Boulevard. Uh, it's just four letters in bright red and blue. L O on top of V E, love. And I suppose it's uh, beautiful. It's uh, certainly fitting, given given that it represents the name that that William Penn gave to the city, Philadelphia. Uh, this is the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, combining those two Greek words, phileo, love, Adelphos, brother, brotherly love. And certainly within towns and cities, there can be that expression of a kind of brotherly love. Towns around uh, the country, cities, even entire nations can experience a, a, a kind of love uh, in, in some form or various forms. You especially sense it after a large-scale catastrophe or crisis like a 9-11. Or recently with a shocking mass shooting. Towns, they come together. There's, there's compassion, there's a sense of love, there's a sense of solidarity that may be shared among people. And there's certainly something good about that. That's the, the, the common grace of God at work in and through people. But is this the love that John is talking about here? A, a kind of general uh, compassion among fellow uh, human beings, philanthropy, uh, or general compassion, kindness, that anyone in the world might, might share? Well, I would suggest it is not. That this is a distinct love, an exclusive love among Christians. Throughout this letter, John has gone above and beyond to make clear some very hard and stark contrasts, certainly between the church and the world. He's made it between those who walk in light, those who are still in darkness, chapter 1, verse 7. He's contrasted the world and the church in chapter 2, verse 15, about those who are of the truth and those who are liars, even antichrists in chapter 2, verse 22. In our text, the contrast we see between those in spiritual death and those who have passed from death to life. Perhaps of greatest relevance for us and for our text is the contrast between those who are children of the evil one, like Cain, he says, and those who have been made the children of God. Recall the first verse of chapter 3, where John said, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. What kind of love is this? Where does this love that John speaks about come from? And as we've seen, that word for what kind in chapter 3, verse 1, it's the same word the disciples uh, said there on the sea amidst the, the, the wind and the waves. And Jesus calms the, the wind and waves and the sea, and the disciples say, what manner, what kind of man is this that the wind and waves obey him? Where does he come from? What kind of love is this that John speaks about? Both in verse 11 of our text and verse 1 of chapter 3, this love from this Father. Well, as we've considered, there's various Words used that get translated love. We see it in the New Testament or in the first century uh, Greek. What is this love that John speaks about? It's not phileo. That love of friendship among friends who share a common interest. It's not storge. That, that love, uh, by way of example, uh, that a mother would have for her daughter, naturally. Or eros, that passionate love between a husband and wife. Nope, John, in chapter 3, verse 1, speaking of this Father's love and his call among Christians to love one another, same word, he, along with the New Testament authors, stress a different love, and it's that agape love. It's a love or word that was not entirely new prior to the New Testament, but it was not common. 
And Jesus and the disciples would make this love central to the Christian faith, faith, and they would give shape to it. This is the love of charity. Some would call this charity. It's what C.S. Lewis called, in one place, gift love. Contrasting it to more natural loves. This love, agape, gives to the undeserving and the seemingly unworthy. And it is a love that does not seek to possess. So it's an open-handed giving kind of love. But it's much more than general charity. Why is that? Because this love is specifically defined by the Lord Jesus Christ. We could say, one, it's Christ-centered. That is, it is done for Christ. It may be directed toward a person, but it is for Christ. It's Christ-motivated. It is a response to the love of Christ in my own life. And three, it is Christ-formed. It takes the shape of the cross, humble and sacrificial. As John returns to this love theme, and he'll return to it again in the next chapter, chapter 4, I see him kind of like a master sculptor. He's giving more and more shape to what this love is and what it looks like, what motivates it. If you've seen a, a sculptor do their work, they might begin with a larger sort of block of clay, and then they begin to carve away and shave away, creating more and more form. And that's part of what John is doing for us. And one of the ways he does that is he brings us back into the early chapters of Genesis to the historical figure Cain, Cain and Abel. Verse 12 of our text, he says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why? John says, because his deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Notice the contrast between Cain, who he says is of the evil one and commits evil deeds, with that of his brother who is righteous and commits righteous deeds. You see, fundamentally, John is using this historical account to help his hearers understand that the way they relate and treat their fellow believers reveals their condition, their true condition, whether they are or are not a, a child of God. And so we travel back to Genesis chapter 4, where the story of Cain and Abel takes place. We learn about these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Abel is a keeper of the sheep, Genesis tells us. He's a shepherd. Remember that. That's important. He's a shepherd. His brother, Cain, is a worker of the ground. And we're told in the story that they both bring an offering to the Lord. And we're told the Lord has regard and acceptance for Abel's offering, but he does not accept, he does not have regard for Cain's offering. It becomes clear that the reason Cain's offering is unacceptable is that he's not of the Lord. His heart is hard. He is not a true believer or worshiper of God. His offering is, we might say, just outward religiosity. He does not love the Lord, God, the Lord his God. He does not know him. He is not redeemed. But it doesn't end there. And I think it's here that Scripture gives us a deeper insight into the nature of man in his fallen state how he naturally views those around him. Cain becomes angry at his brother. He's angry because he's spiritually empty. He's discontent. His anger turns to jealousy and envy. He doesn't want his brother to possess blessing and peace and joy while he's going to continue empty and discontent. Central to John's use of the story of Cain and Abel is that Cain's actions are the opposite, as we will see, to that of the Lord Jesus Christ, and opposite to the way followers of Christ are to live. So Cain's way is the way of the world. It's really about taking from others, tearing down others. 
Remember what the, uh, the Apostle James said in James chapter 4. He says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Cain's murder was merely the outward expression of an inward condition and reality. Jealousy, envy, turning to anger, hatred. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity has a chapter on that great sin he calls pride. But I think we can exchange or insert jealousy or, or envy in place of pride in these words of his. He says, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. It's the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride is gone. And innumerable are the ways that envy and jealousy, sort of one-upmanship, pride, selfish ambition... Uh, are played out and seek to to be played out in our lives. I think just about this last week, many of you are aware that a tree uh, was taken down on the church property. I think on Monday I watched it taken down and and being cut up, and I went outside, I talked with with, with Corey, who took the tree down, and he said, yeah, this tree is going to be, this is going to be available, and I thought, that's great, I'm going to go ahead and get, get some of this. And then he said, yeah, there's probably going to be a church email that goes out. And then I thought to myself, I I need to get on this. I've got to get some wood, and I need to do it quickly. About two or three hours after that email went out, it was gone. I got some wood, though. The, The point is, my initial thought was not, who can I get some wood who can I get wood to, to bring to here? Who might need this? Right? It's, it's kind of a, a small example, seemingly insignificant. But what seems apparently minor is what John is getting us to think about in verse 17. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need but closes his heart, how does God's love abide in him? The reason Cain took from his brother and takes his brother's life is not because first he's at odds with his brother. It's not first a horizontal issue. It's because he's at odds and he's empty spiritually on the vertical plane. How I view and relate to those on a horizontal level is directly reflected in my life with the Lord. It's a central point that John is making. One does not have the Christ-like charity and love to give to others if they have not first received and come to know it from Christ in the first place. Verse 16 is key. By this we know love. If you do not know this, you do not know love. The love that John is mentioning. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Next chapter, chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins, to bear the wrath of God in our place. John's point is not first that the cross of Christ is the example for what love looks like. That's true, but that's secondary. First, one knows this love only when one has come to a saving knowledge that his cross and death was not only an event in history, but as John says, it was for us. It was for us. This is how I know love. Charity. He didn't just demonstrate it. By it, he changed me. He has changed my life. He redeemed me from sin, rescued me from the wages of sin and death. That cross satisfied God's wrath for me. Listen to Paul's words in in Romans 5, verse 5. Paul says, 
God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. The heart is the seat of the emotions and thoughts, what drives our will. It's like a large basin or container or tub. Something is going to fill that and animate the heart. Paul says God has poured, you could translate it, flooded, inundated our hearts with the love of Christ. When Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room and he began washing the feet of his, of his disciples, afterward he says, I have set before you an example. But it was more than an example that Jesus was carrying out as he comes to Peter. And Peter pushes back, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. And he says, unless I wash you, you can have no share with me. He's teaching him and the disciples that they first must receive his love before they can give this love. And indeed, it is a giving love. It gives out of a motivation, a response to the love of Christ. Why am I to give and be charitable to another? Why am I to be charitable toward brothers and sisters? It's not first because they are deserving or because we're fond of them, or even because they have need. It's first because it pleases our Savior. It reflects the love of Jesus Christ. It is a response to his great love for us. Abel, he's a keeper of the sheep. His blood was shed. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that Abel's blood cries out from the ground. It cries out for vengeance. It cries out for justice. It cries out for repayment. But another shepherd would come whose sinless, innocent life would be taken. His blood would be poured out. Yet Hebrews said, says his blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That's good news. His blood does not simply cry out for justice. His blood extends mercy. His shed blood extends grace, charity. His blood atones. His blood is given in love for his people. And and as deep and rich and profound as, as... This love is, John says, one of the most practical ways you can grow in the assurance of your faith is by extending this love in very tangible ways. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need but closes his heart, where's God's love in him? Children, let us not love in mere word but in deed and in truth. How will we love in this way? Who may we show this love to? Who comes to mind? Jesus said in John 13, Love one another as I have loved you. By this the world will know that you are my disciples. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the abundance of your love for us for your fatherly, loving hand, your shepherding hand in our lives, for redeeming us, causing us to be the children of God, for pouring pouring into our hearts your love, that you might fill us to overflowing, that we might know this love and respond to this love, this redeeming grace. And so we pray that you, Lord, would be at work in us, in and through our hearts, extending this love among brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we remember those words from Paul, do not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the household of faith. Lord, may we see our brothers and sisters as blessings and opportunities to extend this charity, this grace. 
Continue to shape us and teach us in your ways. And Lord, as you do that work in your people, we will respond with shouts of joy and praise and adoration for your goodness. We pray, O Lord, that you would continue to go before us as a people in the days and weeks into the summer season that you would encourage our hearts, continue to convict us, lead us, and bless us in every way. We pray all these things in the precious name of of Jesus Christ our Lord.